Movements such as these have given man the power to fashion his way of living. Today we have the internal combustion engine forcing its pistons up and down and the turbine and electric motor producing rotary movement. But to use these forces effectively and conveniently, to convert one form of motion to the other, to change the axis of rotary movement, we use means invented centuries ago. The crank, the cam, and most important of all, the gear. The gear provides the best means for the efficient transfer of power from one direction to another. The earliest example in man's recorded history was the chain of pots, first used some 2,000 years ago. Working through crude spur gears, a horizontal force could be used to raise water vertically. As a result of such work, man established that flowing water itself could provide power. The Norse mill appeared in the Dark Ages in Northern Europe. It had a horizontal paddle wheel with the millstone directly above it. Norse mills were not very efficient and needed fast flowing streams, but their simplicity kept them in use in isolated areas of Europe and Asia until very recent times. By turning the paddle wheel on its side, man learnt to use the power of the water more effectively. The vertical paddle wheel driving the horizontal millstone. This could only be achieved by the use of gears. From its beginnings in the first century, the vertical or Roman mill was to become the major source of power for the next 1800 years. The gear also allows the speed of rotation to be altered. Drive a small wheel and couple it to a large one. In the time that the small wheel rotates once, the large wheel completes only half a revolution. Its speed is less than that of the small wheel. If we drive the large wheel, then the small wheel coupled to it will rotate at a higher speed. The change in speed is determined by the respective number of teeth on each gear, that is, the gear ratio. In modern times, it's in the control of speed that gears are most widely used. The ship's turbine, which rotates at about 7,000 revolutions per minute, must be geared down to drive the propeller, which turns at less than 100 revolutions per minute. Large speed reductions of this kind require two or three stages to achieve them. As the early water mills were developed, the ability of gears to regulate speed was soon realized. Lantern wheels and pinions of different sizes were used to adjust the rotary speed of the millstones so that the best milling speed could be obtained. It was seen too that gears could multiply the force being applied and give a mechanical advantage. A gear wheel is essentially a series of levers acting in turn. A small force at one end of a lever can move a large load at the other. The small force must be further from the fulcrum and so must move through a greater distance. The small force will therefore move faster. 
but at the slow moving end, greater power is available. And so it is with gears. A small applied force can, by reducing the speed of rotation, give an increase in the power available. Making full use of these basic principles, the number of water mills grew rapidly. While in their most primitive form they produced only three horsepower, they were still the most powerful prime mover invented. In time, many improvements were made. The overshot wheel made its appearance, using the weight of the water to provide power. In the 17th and 18th centuries, when they reached their peak, thousands of mills were at work, some capable of delivering up to 30 horsepower. And the power was applied in many different ways. In mining, in the forming of metals, in the extraction of gold, in the Sawyer's yard, in the production of woolen cloth. From crushing sugarcane in the West Indies to grinding flints for the Staffordshire potteries, water mills were used in almost every form of industry. And water was not the only source of power to be harnessed for man's benefit. Windmills first appeared in northern Europe at the beginning of the 13th century. Within 200 years, they were in widespread use throughout the whole of Europe. Gears were again used for changing the plane of rotation, for regulating speed, and for driving ancillary machinery. Yet despite the increasing use and development of water and windmills, the gears themselves had changed very little. They were made of wood and remained fairly crude. But development was going on elsewhere. From the middle of the 14th century in Europe, and perhaps earlier in China, mechanical clocks were being constructed. Introduced in the West to help order the disciplines of religious communities, these clocks were the product of the blacksmith's forge and had gear wheels made of metal. It was the need for accurate timekeeping that led to work on the theory of gears and on the best shape for their teeth. It was established that if teeth slid across one another, friction was high. But if a continuous rolling contact could be achieved, the friction would be reduced. One shape which went some way to achieving this was the cycloid, the path traced by a point on a circle as it rolls along a straight line. Later it was discovered that the involute curve, which is traced out by a point on a straight line as it rolls around a base circle, was even better. First proposed in the mid-18th century, the involute has since become universally accepted as the best profile for gear teeth. This shape gives a high degree of rolling contact between the tooth surfaces. A little of this early theory reached the craftsmen of that time. 
while gear teeth may have been cut more carefully, their shape was not much improved. Some mills did begin to replace wooden gears with iron ones, and the bevel gear was being introduced to change the plane of rotation. But it was with the coming of the Industrial Revolution that the fundamental work really bore fruit. As the Industrial Revolution grew, the use of steam engines increased until they challenged the supremacy of the water wheel. And wherever they worked, belts, chains and gears were needed to transfer their power. More powerful engines were developed and gear wheels had to take greater loads. So the use of cast iron and the correct tooth shape became vitally important. Lubrication too became a key factor and has remained so ever since. The Industrial Revolution spread, and gears were able to play their part in transferring the power to wherever it was needed. Not only spur and bevel gears, but also the worm gear. Providing very high gear ratios, this compact gear was of great value in many industrial machines. Gear cutting machinery became more accurate and in the 1840s the principle of gear generation was first applied in the United States of America. One wheel with cutting teeth of the correct profile generates the same shape in a blank wheel. So vast numbers of identical wheels can be cut. Gear wheels with involute teeth were interchangeable across a range of sizes. As the age of mass production approached, gear technology was able to meet all requirements. differential gear used occasionally by some of the early clockmakers appeared for the first time on the road in the tricycle. And now a standard feature of the motor car, the differential solves the problem of cornering. The outer wheel must travel farther than the inner one, and so it must be able to turn slightly faster. The coming of the internal combustion engine and its development in the motor car to produce greater speed and power provided the next stimulus for gear development. Also significant was the introduction of the first practical steam turbine by Parsons, which was used in the first ever turbine-powered ship in 1897. The turbine runs at a speed of up to 20,000 revolutions per minute. Consequently, much higher gear ratios are involved. The two-stage reduction in speed was a notable step forward in the control and transfer of large-scale power. For both turbine and internal combustion engine, running at high speeds and having to gear down for the power to be applied, the smooth meshing of gear teeth became essential. To overcome this problem, teeth cut on a slant were introduced, 
This ensures that more than one pair of teeth are in contact all the time. These helical gears may be either single or double. The double helical is slightly more difficult to cut, but it eliminates much of the sideways thrust that can otherwise be a problem. In heavy industry too, their advantages were soon recognized. Smoother and quieter running, they also suffer less wear. Motor vehicles, as well as some of the early industrial machines, needed a range of gears. This was first achieved by sliding wheels of different diameter into mesh in turn. But these gearboxes were not always easy to operate and called for great skill on the part of the driver. More sophisticated systems were developed, which culminated in the synchromesh gearbox. In this, the teeth are always in mesh but only the gear in use actually drives the shaft. The rest can rotate freely. The driving gear is locked onto the shaft by the synchromesh coupling. This also synchronizes the speeds of shaft and gear before coupling them together. The sun and planet gear was originally devised by James Watt in 1781, when a patent barred him from using the crank. More recently, the principle has been used again in the epicyclic gearbox. There may be two or more planet gears linked by a carrier and rotating round the sun gear. This system is contained within a ring gear. The epicyclic gearbox provides a compact and flexible system. It is able to handle high power loads. The large gearboxes are commonly used with marine turbines, while smaller versions are used for automatic gearboxes. But the epicyclic is only one of the many forms in which gears are now produced. They are used wherever the passage or movement of power is needed. Gears are the means to an end. Using the same principles and playing as essential a role in our way of life as when they were first discovered 2,000 years ago. Mm -hmm.